Okay. So, yeah, I would like to take uh, the perspective of, of the real-time application developer today, uh, but also sneaking in a little bit of uh, knowledge and experience from the kernel side. You know, um, how does it do? Oh, okay. Um, you know, uh, it is about hard real-time. Uh, it's a hard topic, so only the hard folks should do that. Um, this is reality, obviously. Um, so real-time application developers received extra training. They are very good in their job. They have real-time system design experience. They have a deep understanding how the kernel works underneath them. The tool chains, the libraries, you name them. Um, they only write simple programs still. Uh, just a single application or a single thread, basically. No log nesting, whatever. And yeah, they obviously know what is real-time and what is best effort and how to split things properly. Where did you know? Yes, this is, we have all these people on our side as well, um, but we have customers, unfortunately. Oh, no, sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, so to give you a stage, what could go wrong, possibly? I mean, these are the simple things you look at if you ever list a, a real-time program that is not behaving as expected. Nah, you shouldn't do printing when you don't know where it's going to be printed to. I mean, the malloc in your critical loop is the famous one. It works most of the time, very fast, except when not. Um, these are the simple e uh, issues. Um, but it's getting more complicated if you look in the details. You may I read from a file descriptor by say, might be good, might be bad, depending on the context. So what are you reading from? So it's already getting harder just to read the code from that level uh, to understand if there's a problem or not. Um, or if you're dealing with memory mapped yeah. interfaces, now where does the memory come from? Is it RAM backed? Is it is it whatever hardware backed but deterministic, or is it something which vanishes and comes back because it's coming from a memory mapped file or something like this? And then there are languages which can help you not that much. Um, this is actually from real code, uh, kind of. I've seen it. <laughs> it's not not that rare apparently. Um, there are languages basically hiding you or runtimes writing you uh, what's happening underneath, um, like what kind of lock you're using. Now the problem, uh, if you want to do multi-priority multi threads, um, the lock has to take into account what the lock holder's priority is, obviously. Otherwise, things can take quite a while until it actually happens. And yeah, if the runtime tells you it's easy to do uh, synchronization but doesn't help you with um, annotating it properly, you have a problem. Um, that was also hard to find for us, at least, back then. Um, but again, this language, um, it's thread safe, but it's unfortunately real-time safe. Because underneath this runtime does introduce some nice locks, which again, leads to the previous slides, are not real-time, fully real-time aware. Now, that's, so to say, a subset of the possible things that go wrong if you just write straightforward code which should behave deterministically. Now, the point is, or the good thing is, as we all know, RT for the Linux kernel is uh, giving us a very flexible environment that everything works generally quite well. Um, too well, I would say, in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, you have standard syscalls. They all should behave well to the degree you use the right for the right context. Uh, but they don't tell you very clearly if they're not behaving. You see it possibly too late. So fact is the kernel by itself is real time aware, but not all actual, uh, all corners of it, obviously. Um, this is the, the modern approach, some people say. Um, this is the old style approach. Um, you have two kernels in the same base. Um, so I'm also maintaining the Xenon my project for quite a while. Um, which has a dual kernel approach, so you have two schedulers in one system um, and the task have to choose which scheduler to use. So there's the real-time one and there's the Linux one. Um, and if a task is in the real-time domain, well, everything is done as good as possible for the real-time domain. It has been designed for that. It has been limited, eliminated any kind of these problem spaces. You have special system calls you can issue or you have to issue. And you can still use Linux as well, um, but then you are basically stepping across the border. Um, and, and that is, yeah, this is an immediate feedback the application can get. So it has pros and cons. From an application point of view, this is what people tell me again when they're using the system. Um, that's very convenient because the application gets, can get, this is what we actually have in the system, early feedback when they are stepping over that line. Um, 
But obviously, from the implementation point of view, don't want to go into this in this talk here. This is obviously, you pay the price in the system and the integration of the lower levels. Um, but again, we are looking at the user perspective. So we have quite a few users who are very, very happy with large applications that they get this kind of feedback early when they are stepping over the line. So this is about mechanism versus policy. And now thinking in the two domains, because as I said, we have both scenarios. We're not only running on Xenomai, we're also running a lot of PrentRT. So what has to be done in order to have the same thing also with standard kernel? Um, how to detect things, first thing. So we have Xenomai, as I said, this is architecturally separated. You get this kind of, you can get this kind of information at the point of migration. What do you do with mainline? Well, you have to instrument and you have to, well, have something there. Um, that's, I would like to throw in here in the discussion as well. This is one thing, where to detect that there is possibly a problem with the application. The other thing is obviously um, how to report the problem. Yeah? Um, you could look at traces afterwards, but maybe the application can get the information earlier. In Xenoma, we built in a, a signal, we piggyback on an existing rather used signal and say, okay, if the application wants the information, it gets the signal injected. So early report. How to do it maybe with, with mainline. But the trigger part is also when do we trigger. Né? So application has a life cycle set up. Operation teardown. You don't want to report about problems during setup, at least not real-time problems, because this is best effort anyway. So you have to, to in, inform the system, I'm operational, I'm just setting up, tearing down. That's the mechanism needed for that. Um, and then the tricky part really is, as I said, we are paying on the my side the price in the kernel. Um, how do you instrument? The, the, how do you tell what is real-time, what is not? Now for one, one is real time is a microsecond, for others it's a milliseconds, for others again a second, for example. But what is the context? So here's the tricky thing I would say. Um, is there a way to describe, so to say, your expectation as application developer or your, ex your, your promises as system provider towards the application so that this is, a, you can build up the, 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 the treaty between both and you can say, okay, this is what I can deliver, this is what you want, there's a mismatch, I will tell you, but how to maintain that? On the kernel side, on the user land side, library on library on library, if you want to allow that kind of thing. So this is, I think, probably the challenge, and this is the thing that is uh, driving us for quite a while. Um, there's some common ground, I think, between both worlds, um, and there's definitely some <laughs> separate parts. So there's common ground, I would say, in this provide tooling, instrumentation, I don't know what, um, to do these late failing things. Né? A malloc will be seen in the mainline kernel as well as a problem at some stage when you are close to short memory and you are doing the malloc from your real-time workload, you get the latency. But this is too late because this may happen already in the field. You want to have it earlier. So having instrumentation on these calls which are mostly behaving quite well but should already on the first call give you a feedback, this is generally not a good idea. That could be a common ground because it's high up in the stack, it's in, in general libraries, maybe there is some, some ways to do that. Um, but also in the way how to tell the system the expectations, like I'm operational, I'm in the setup phase, I have this kind of delay expectations. Um, well, get deadline obviously is a way to express this, but not everything is modeled this way. So maybe there's also some crumb ground in this area. And with that, I would open up for discussions and ideas. Thomas. <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, there's a, a similar thing has been uh, tried, and it was, the approach was horrible, um, for uh, isolation. Um, so we, we back then um, asked the, the, the people who were just, uh, it was just duct tape into the code, um, trying to explore the, the trace points, whether you can hook up into that. And I think nowadays with eBPF, uh, on a trace point, you actually can do it quite uh, elegantly. I mean, not that I'm advocating for BPF, but <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's actually useful. Uh, actually, this is uh, something I've been working on um, 
for tracing is S-Frame work. I'm very familiar with that, where we get actually, okay, so it's a way, it's kind of like Orc Unwinder in user space, where we actually do user space unwinding uh, from the kernel. I'm wondering if, it, if you're worried about certain system calls, like, you know, we have the might sleep or whatever, if we know something is like dangerous, if it's possible that we could hook into something that it would walk, go walk all the way up and it could tell you every single, like, you know, it could tell you where in user space you're calling dangerous functions. Would that, something like that? That would answer part of the points, but this is the mechanism. Yeah, that we get right. right now with the signal, we also can obviously install a signal hand and do the backtrace, for example, from the signal hand and application. Say, okay, this is where I came from. Okay. This is my framework and this is the syscall entry. Yes, it's an important element and it's part of the problem and it's good that we have the options there, but yeah. it's not only the full solution. Right, right, right. right. Um, but, uh, so um, you you mentioned Scadella, and, and I get it's not for for everything, but uh, I guess the end the end I guess the the end bad results you get is kind of a deadline miss, right? So we are talking about so anything that has a deadline sh should be can be modeled. Yeah, but do you because know so upfront? This is my, my, my challenge is do I want to have this information as early as possible. I don't want to sit down with the customer of our customer to debug their application by looking from a system level at this one, which is currently often uh, with the no, what I wanna... is happening. I want to have this information to the developer as easy as possible, as early as possible. Now, yes. Like from the compiler. The compiler says you are compiling nonsense. Stop it. It doesn't even compile it. Ah, right. This okay. is something I have in mind, however we can achieve that and how far we can go. No perfection, but this would be the yeah, interesting thing. The but there were other questions before. Yeah. Uh, we looked into many things. The point is, as I said, it's the mechanism is one element, it's an important one, but it doesn't give you automatically the information. What's the context? You need also some way to express the right context. Is this file descriptor the right one? Is it the wrong one? in your context, né? and even more complex things. It's not just binary, this is called is good, that one is bad. There are such things, but there are also these in between. That's why I mentioned the read syscall. I think perhaps you need to kind of break the problem down into the different parts. You're right, there's the getting the developer feedback at the time they're putting the system together and being able to kind of trace where the problem points are. And then there's that actually verifying that a given process that needs the real-time guarantee in your integration is, is meeting its guarantees there. I think that for the latter, actually measuring it based on what the expectations of the process are and being able to document that, you know, actually have those, those expectations documented and, and verified by perhaps by a user space process uh, operating at the same time is one way to do it. But I, I'd be really interested in those kind of early feedback mechanisms on individual syscalls. But I think breaking the problem into two parts is probably the, the, the only way you're going to solve it. Um, I, I'm wondering how much real time this real time is, in the sense that uh, <laughs> if you have a malloc there, uh, really, uh, and also are you doing anything like uh, mlock uh, pre-fault in the pages? Uh, are you telling that to your customers? Because like, it doesn't look like real time. <laughs> it's very easy. Just zero jitter. That's the customer expectation. There's zero jitter. There's maximum speed, nanosecond execution time. But Thomas can explain it better. So just to clarify, real time is not <laughs> about as fast or whatever as possible. It's as fast as specified. And if yes. my period is two, two milliseconds, that's one thing. If my period is two minutes, it's still real time because I can't miss it. So I don't need mlock for a two, milli, uh, two minutes period. I might need it for two milliseconds. That's really a, f a completely system and application specific uh, setup and configuration thing, real time is not something which is globally specifiable. Yeah. I understand, but the thing is, uh, Mike. And and in 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 some cases, it's it's <laughs> totally fine to do to do a read system call inside of a real time task, I, I, if your constraints allows it. Okay, uh, I don't want this to fall into what's real time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Actually, you. I want I keep with, uh, to keep with the topic right now, okay? Yeah. So I'm wondering, one question is, so something like what you're looking at, is if you were able to give the customer something like an annotation, something that said, hey, and put in like a requirement, I, from, uh, 
point A in the like in this code and point B and tell like the compiler that I expect this to take X amount of instructions or something like that. And if the compiler says, oh my God, you're doing all, like you're calling this function that's bloating up and yep. this kind of blowing up, yep. then say fail. You so basically it looks like what you want is a compiler help. Kind of. I mean, I'm also competing, obviously, at least from some expectations, with these old-style artoses where you can read out, okay, this is taking me n instructions if I call this, or this is taking n times m instructions when I call it. We don't get there. I know. The hardware already but, plays yeah. no longer that, that game with us. Um, but we need something in between. We cannot expect that it's exact specified. Unfortunately, we can get into certain problem domains where we have an, a range of expectations. And obviously, we don't want the customer to over document things. Um, we need a certain level of, OK, gray, red, I don't know what, but black areas so that we can simplify the problem as much as possible. But it still sounds like you have to, like some sort of, um, you're asking more help from a compiler, like you said. So well, basically, if the compiler actually knew, like this function the does. Compiler, not necessarily, because the compiler doesn't know what you call in the end. If if it's not a complete. No, I think you need also uh, information which the programmer puts into it. Let's go to the file descriptor uh, uh, example. If it's on on uh, tempfs or ramfs or whatever, it might be perfectly fine, but. The compiler doesn't know. Runtime doesn't know. So what you need is dear, some information. Hey, this is a safe file descriptor. Then you can, then the the logic down somewhere can say, okay, if you call read on a safe file descriptor, I'm not yelling at you. But if you read on a non-safe one, then I'm going to to poke you. So basically, you write it in Rust. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, to throw. I mean, we have we have quite some of these things. Um, think about the mini cool dumper. It's an it, it's a bad analogy, but the application programmer only the application programmer knows which parts of the memory are actually valuable to be dumped in order to get information out of it. So I think there are two options here that are both uh, valid and um, play well together. One is you can do some static analysis of the program. For example, for saying, OK, you are using malloc there. No, not, not a good idea. So some of the analysis could be done just looking at the program. And the other aspect is that I think is what you need, uh, you are looking for, is to ask the system uh, for example, I'm going to have this kind of timer. I, I want to have this cyclic uh, execution. So tell me, at this point in time, if that is going to be possible, taking into account the number of processes that are there. For example, assuming you are going to be a real-time process in the scheduling, how many are higher priority than you and all of that. So it's like, OK, at this point in time, all of, the, all of what I'm asking is possible or not. Um, would already be nice, yes, but I think this is already two steps ahead. Okay. But it, yeah. So, so this is obviously like if we generalize a bit, it's first a business problem because you want to deal with customers, and then it's a communication problem, and then it's a specification problem, and then it's an integration problem across all that. So and. From my limited experience, for example, the security module folks, like the Linux security modules, whatever, SMAC or uh, uh, the others, the, you can have like a specification of the requirements per system call XYZ and other hooks mechanism. Would that, such a mechanism, would, be, would that be useful or not? So. It could be. I mean, in the end, also the question is if you can man then maintain the policy along that. Uh, that, mm -hmm. As I said, this is a, if there's a simple mechanism, great. Is it also something we can, I can maintain in the in annotation? Or can I offload the annotation to the user? Or can I... Uh, that's the question, the second I'm, I'm well, driving with. But then we go back to the point that yeah. each user has different... Uh, yes, so I know. It's not, a, it's not an easy problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. So, yeah, that's all from me, thanks. Tom, a second. Maybe you should just start building a library with very easy to solve problems. Yeah. 
and then try to figure out with real world application programmers whether they can use it or not and whether they, there's a benefit. Yes. And then start from there and build more complex things on top and see how it involves. This I think that's the only yeah. that's yeah. the only approach you can take. I mean, there's no yes. there's Ideally, no all-in-one yes. yeah. yeah, yeah. solution we can come up with. No, no. Um, one thing you could have the thing at is something like a glibc wrapper, where you will see malloc and everything, and the glibc would could look at the P, uh, the process um, priority and then figure out is malloc bad, is malloc not bad. Covering so, POSIX is yeah. huge, but this would... Fact is, we already have this instrumentation, and we shared it with some people, and they're now busy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Busy yeah. and happy or busy? At least so, busy. Uh, that's the time. <laughs> Oops, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.